California awaits the official announcement of the winner of this week's presidential election. We'll have a live update from Nairobi. A unique church service strikes a chord with Ugandans living in Boston. And in our Music Makers segment, we'll groove to one of South Africa's hottest bands and hear from two of the group's members. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gito. You at Info Vincent Macquarie, who will join us shortly from Nairobi. This is Africa 54. Security is tight in Kenya on Friday as voters anxiously wait for the announcement of the winner of the nation's presidential election. Police have positioned extra forces at the airport in the western city of Kisumu, but Nairobi, the capital, is largely quiet with little traffic. Many businesses are closed. Tuesday's vote marked opposition leader Raila Odinga's second attempt in four years to defeat incumbent President Uhuru Kenyatta. Opposition leaders repeated their claims of fraud, claiming the Electoral Commission's computer networks were hacked, but mainly appealed to supporters to remain calm. Kenya-based diplomats are calling for patience and say any election complaints must be channeled through the courts instead of the streets. Odinga's criticism of the vote comes despite the opinion of a panel of international election observers that the poll was conducted in a credible manner. We can say that the processes, as we were able to observe, up to and including the counting of the votes at the polling stations and their transmission to the IEBC and so on, met the standards set by Kenya and the AU for the conduct of democratic elections. Provisional tallies released by the Electoral Commission so far indicate Kenyatta has a nine-point lead over Odinga. For the very latest election news, let's go to Africa 54 managing editor Vincent Macquarie, who is standing by live via Skype in Nairobi. Good evening, Vincent, and please bring us up to speed with the latest from Nairobi. Well, at the moment as we speak, actually, the country is in a kind of a standstill. Uh, the IBC has said that it will be making announcements uh, uh, anytime, I suppose this evening, to uh, clarify whether they have received uh, all the data that they need, all the forms uh, that were remaining, the 34 A's and B's, and then thereafter they will uh, complete the process of tallying, verifying, and then they'll make an announcement. So as of, as of now, they have actually not made any announcement. But well, there's high anticipation. You can see both camps uh, being represented, are uh, being represented right now at uh, the Bombers of Kenya, the Tallinn Center. Everybody is anxiously waiting to see if the announcement will be made tonight. But uh, nothing yet, nothing has been announced. But uh, you can tell that uh, it's in the air. Everybody is expecting something to happen. And so the Electoral Commission is not giving any particular reason why this has been delayed because people have been waiting since early hours of today? Well, they said they needed to get all the documents, the so-called 34 A's and B's, because uh, that is, uh, by law, uh, the basis on which uh, the final result would be announced. And especially now that uh, the opposition has cast aspersions on the uh, interim uh, numbers, the interim results, they want to make sure that they uh, get it right, get all the documents, and they were not going to make an announcement before they get all of them in, and that all the parties will have a look at them, they will verify, and everybody should be satisfied before they can make an announcement. They made it very clear this afternoon that they would rather delay, but get it right, rather than make a quick announcement, and then they make a mistake, which might lead to uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, problems legally and otherwise. Understandable. Now, Vincent, we've seen video shots of uh, opposition leader Raila Odinga and also Deputy President uh, William Ruto at the Bombers of Kenya, the venue where they're supposed to announce this result. Have they interacted? Uh, uh, come again, please. Did they have any interaction, the opposition leader and the Deputy President? Well, I've been observing, I haven't seen any interaction yet. Uh, it's possible, but uh, somehow, uh, if it has happened, I haven't witnessed personally. Uh, we know that at this time things are really tense, and, and I don't think the two camps are very happy with each other, especially given that uh, Royal Odinga's camp is very insistent that uh, they have won this election and that the Electoral Commission has uh, messed up the whole process, which is a very serious charge. 
and you can imagine that the other side uh, uh, is waiting to be uh, validated as the you know the victors uh, in this race. I don't think they have so much love at this time. Uh, we can only wait and see. Has uh, President Kenyatta been at the venue yet or said anything? Not yet. In fact, he was expected to be shortly at the Kenyatta International Conference Center, which is the headquarters of the Jubilee Coalition. Uh, that is where they've been operating from. He's expected to make a statement, but he said he'll do that after the chairman of the IBC has briefed uh, the public, uh, which is expected sometime, any time now. And once that happens, then we'll hear from him. Well, we'll keep watching, Vincent. Thank you very much. Africa 54's managing editor Vincent Macquarie reporting live for us via Skype from Nairobi. Now for more analysis on Kenya's presidential election, I'm joined by Professor David Monda. He is a political scientist from City University of New York and a native of Kenya. Professor, a very warm welcome to you uh, to our Africa 54 show. What do you make of this delay, if anything, given the already very tense situation in Kenya? Firstly, thank you for having me. Um, I think it's a really challenging situation right now. The IBC obviously has to um, be um, to get this right. They have to make sure that there's a clear correlation between the uh, Form 34A and Form 34B, and that that correlates with the results which were being transmitted um, digitally and on the screens at, at the BOMAS. Uh, it's very tense also because there seems to be some uh, conflict between the results that the opposition's producing, the NASA coalition, and that uh, the IEBC is producing. And of course, Jubilee Alliance is caught somewhere in between. So it would be really imperative that this situation gets sorted out as soon as possible, but ultimately that it gets done right. Now, you know, you talk about that being a very tense situation, but the man on the spotlight today is the chairman of IEBC, Mr. Wafula Chebukati. Yes. How should he handle this announcement? I think he should take his time. And I would also say that it's not only the chairman, but the whole commission, uh, the integrity of the commission is in question. Part of the challenge we've had with this election is the commission has tended at certain points to uh, produce conflicting information. For example, in relation to the, um, the issue of hacking, at one point the chairman said that there was an attempt to um, hack the system and later his deputy came ahead and contradicted him and said there was no hacking. And then the, a day later, one of the commissioners came out and said that there was no hacking, so there's no need to look for a hacker. So you can see that with these conflicting um, uh, announcements from the commission, it really creates a high level of uncertainty. The second issue is in relation to the transmission of the tallying of what was actually uh, produced in the field. Um, there seems to be a mismatch between what was actually being transmitted on the screens and a direct follow-up. In other words, a synchronized direct follow-up of the Form 34 A's and B's. The opposition NASA coalition saying that there's a gap in between those two um, um, processes and they think there's some room for some um, um, monkey business in between. Now, you know the opposition coalition today has called on the Electoral Commission to give it access to its computer servers, saying it would accept the results of the vote based on the figures recorded there. Is this also constitutional? I think that creates really uh, major problems because um, if the opposition gets access to the servers, then the Jubilee Coalition will also want to get access to the servers, and you can see the kind of constitutional and legal problems that would create. It really then creates a situation where uh, the public, uh, within the public domain, ultimately the Kenyan voter has real doubts about exactly who's telling the truth because you have a shouting match between the two. Ultimately, the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission is supposed to be independent. So we need to have a level of ethics and integrity and trust with the results that are being uh, tabulated digitally and also in paper form with the paper trail. Now, Professor, briefly, if, what is the biggest challenge for President Uhuru Kenyatta if he takes oath of office in terms of reuniting the divided Kenyans? Uh, at, at this point, it will be for him to reach out to the, the opposition and show the nation clearly that you know, he's a president for all. At this point, the way things look like, uh, the NASA coalition seems like it will petition the results. 
Um, and then it's, we, we're going to have a, a court process going on because they have seven days to petition the results from the declaration of the results. And then we'll have a court process within 14 days. The Supreme Court will have to come up with a decision. And then after that decision is declared, um, depending on what the court decides, we either have another, uh, the whole process over again, or um, things stay as they now, are. What next in terms of the political future of Raila Odinga? Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Uh, I think this is his last shot. If he loses this chance, then the opposition will have to have a new leader and Kenya will have to move forward. Well, Professor, thank you very much for your insight. You're welcome. Uh, Professor David Monda is a political scientist from the City University of New York. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, a unique church service in Boston, tailor-made for Ugandan experts. Stay with us. My name is Carla Babb and I work the Pentagon Beat. That access helps me to do better stories. Every day it's my responsibility to collect all of the defense news. It keeps our VOA viewers informed. I get to travel all across the globe. Anything that's defense related and how to protect and keep people safe, that's where I'll go. So it's never a dull moment at the Pentagon. My name is Carla Babb. This is my Beat. Welcome back to Africa 54. Spiritual practice and meditation are important regardless of where someone lives, whether they live in a remote village in Uganda or in the United States. Spiritual practice differs only according to one's religion. Ugandans who live in Boston pray in the language they feel they can communicate best, Luganda. It's the same language NBS reporter Solomon Serwanja and VOS Paul Diho and cameraman Godfrey Badibai chose as they joined a special service entirely dedicated to the community of Ugandans in Boston. It is Sunday morning here in Boston and several churches are packed to capacity with Ugandans worshipping and praising God. Church is a meeting place to share testimonies and fellowship with one another in a spirit of togetherness as Ugandans living abroad. Along with Voice of America's Paul Ndiho, my colleague Ronnie Mayanja and my cameraman Godfrey Badevie, we are out to seek God's intervention and direction. St. Peter's Anglican Church is our first stop as we check out how Ugandans worship. Here we find the service already in progress. The service is conducted entirely in Luganda, including hymns and sermons. Praying in Uganda, I mean, and, and that's one of the biggest attractions. Uh, some of us, we've got kids here, and, they, and they, the only time that, you know, we get the opportunity for them to hear other people speaking in Uganda is when we come for this, this kind of service. This church is a brainchild of the Church of Uganda Namirembe Diocese and has an average Sunday congregation of about 400 people. Praise in Uganda. Uh, it's uh, just last Sunday we had our uh, bishop from Uganda. Uh, Archbishop Puntagali, he was to visit us to celebrate 10 years of existence. But for the Ugandan congregation, it is more than just prayers. It's an opportunity for children to learn their language and culture. So it's so refreshing. It brings people back home and uh, I mean, you can't ask for anything better. Yes, Thank you. Yeah. Not all has been rosy for St. Peter's Anglican Church. As the church turned 10 years last month, a plan for celebration turned into mourning after a guest invited to officiate suddenly died. They came on Sunday. Uh, he died, I think it was Tuesday. So we had to, to mobilize you know, funds to take back his body. And the entire community you know, came together and we managed to, you know, to raise funds to take his body back to, to Uganda. From the Anglican service, we moved to St. Mary's Cathedral, a Catholic church 
with an average congregation of about 800 people. Mass here is also conducted in Luganda, but unfortunately we find the mass in conclusion. Uh, for me personally, uh, this is my home, this is my parish, mm -hmm. but I'm not assigned here. But still as a priest, a Catholic priest, I'm assigned to any parish in the Archdiocese of Boston. Mm -hmm. So I hope to use my skills, my studies from school, uh, to engage the community, to unite the community, and to be with them when they are happy and also to be with them when they are sad. Well, there's much more to prayer when you come to church. It's about getting together. Ugandans come over here, interact, and as you can see, they've just finished the service and they're actually going to go for a meal. Every end of month, they all congregate together, eat together, remind themselves of why they're here, but most importantly, fellowship together and that is very important because it helps them bond together. Once the meals are done, they get involved in different activities. So we connect and uh, we, we teach them our culture so that we relate it to religion. So they pick pieces here and there relating culture and religion. And it has really helped us because the culture here is different and we can say they don't have culture here. This is a mixture of people from all over. But to hear this is the nucleus of us. For the more than 7,000 Ugandans living in Boston, America feels like home away from home with the comfort of these Sunday fellowships that nuts away their homesickness, which often sets in. Solomon Serwanja, NBS in Boston, Massachusetts. In our Friday business report, Nigeria, Africa's largest economy, is focusing on logistics to improve e-commerce. And with more details, here's Gio Malandrino reporting from the Nasdaq market site in New York. Court Africa Weekly Brief took a look at digital mapping and e-commerce in Africa's largest economy. Practical challenges are a way of life with running a business in Nigeria, and logistics rarely make it near to the top. Instead, some of the most common complaints are around problems with power shortages, talent recruitment, and corruption. But poor logistics infrastructure is a downside that's a debilitating part of doing business in Nigeria, particularly in Lagos, the nation's commercial hub. It means even the most basic home delivery business in Nigeria requires a very hands-on local approach. Trying to locate an address in large swaths of Lagos, especially outside the commercial districts, typically involves stopping and asking for directions several times. The lack of comprehensive mapping has been a challenge for modern local businesses in e-commerce like Jumia and Conga and ride-sharing companies like Uber and Taxify. But over the past year especially, digital mapping technology like Google Maps, for example, have become viable alternatives to help fix that problem. Google's map service has proven popular among young Nigerians, and last year, the service's user numbers in Nigeria doubled. Nigeria's postal service, NIPOST, is also looking to up its efficiency by leveraging that technology. From the NASDAQ market site in New York, I'm Jill Malandrino, and this is Africa 54 Business News. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. Jovi and Hiloni of South Africa's BCUS Band will be right back. I do not believe that they knew my, my nationality when they when when, when they could, when they caught me. Um, they obviously would have really preferred me to have been British. This would have been first prize.
Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Why is a giant chicken that looks like President Donald Trump roasting near the White House? The enormous balloon is the brainchild of a filmmaker Taran Singh Bra as a protest. Bra confirms that he obtained the necessary permits to display the 30-foot balloon. It took him five months to secure the permit and gain permission to stage the protest, which happened to fall during Trump's 17-day vacation at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey. The inflatable Trump chicken made its first appearance in the U.S. in April during tax demonstrations. Next up, artificial intelligence robots are turbocharging the race to find new drugs for conditions like nerve disorder, ALS, or motor neuron disease. The robot's complex software ran through powerful computers, work as tireless and unbiased super researchers. They analyze huge chemical, biological, and medical databases alongside reams of uh, scientific papers far quicker than humanly possible throwing up new biological targets and potential drugs. If the research goes on to deliver new medicines, it would mark a notable victory for AI in drug discovery, bolstering the prospects of a growing batch of startup companies focused on the technology. And finally, hungry hounds in Egypt's capital are enjoying a new doggy delivery service inspired by falling imports of their usual canned food. Omar Tharawati, a political writer, started the new service from his kitchen after realizing that the meals he prepared for his own pooches might appeal to a wider audience. His home-cooked meals for dogs delivered right to the door helped meet a new demand created by a shortage of foreign currency and an increase on tariffs of hundreds of products. Tharawati's business, while small, aims to combat the rising prices of imported dog food after the devaluation of the Egyptian pound late last year. And that's what's trending today. And in our Music Makers segment, we have one of the hottest live bands to come out of South Africa, BCUC. They recently performed at the Festival D2 du Monde in France and let's watch some of their performance in a bonus interview with two of its members, Jovi and Hiloni. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Jovi from PCUC. Yeah. Hello, I'm Floni from Soweto, Johannesburg, South Africa. BCU stands for Bantu Continua Uhuru Consciousness. It's Bantu, is Zulu for people. Continua is English, continuing. Uhuru is in Swahili, which means freedom. Consciousness is consciousness. And the band BCUC consists of seven people. So I, Jovi, uh, sings, like I do the lead vocals and everything. Shoni, uh, it does the big tracks and it does the nose whistles and the whistles and then we've got uh, Humuzo, the only female in the band. She sings like an angel. <laughs> And then we've got uh, Chicks. Chicks, he plays congas. No, and we've got uh, Luja. Luja plays the big drum with one stick and he raps too. And we've got Skumbuzo. Skumbuzo plays a traditional uh, Zulu drum. So he plays it with both hands. So basically we've got two 
traditional drums. One we play it in the Western way, and the other one we play it the African way. And we've got Musebisi. Musebisi plays the bass. He's the only Western instrument that we have, and he's amazing. Ha! Musical warriors means like um, because the world of politics can be so drowning and overwhelming, you know, we, cho we choose to use our music as a tool of uniting people away from political beliefs, away from religious beliefs, away from cultural differences belief, you know. With our music, we're making sure that we're creating a place where everyone can meet there and celebrate and think about what makes us common than think about what makes us different. Because we believe that with our music, we show that we've got a lot of things that are in common than three, four, five things that are different. And with our music, we don't have time to talk about what went wrong. We've got more time to talk about solutions, the how can we go forward from here. Uh, make sure you check out more of BCUC and listen to the music and research about South Africa. We don't live with lions, please. That is our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa, between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks for watching and a very good night from Washington. Welcome to English in a Minute. A cannon used to be a common military weapon. Loose cannon. So are Anna and Jonathan talking about an old battle? Hey, I'm looking for someone to host a political event tomorrow night. Can your friend Sylvia help out? Sylvia, she's a loose cannon. You never know what she's going to say. She could easily.